Before we start talking about the different types of shock, I thought it would help to review some of the vasoactive agents like pressors and inotropes that we use to treat these patients. To start off with, let's review the pharmacology of the different receptors that these vasoactive agents work on. The first that we'll talk about are the adrenergic receptors, which include beta-1, beta-2, alpha, and then also separately dopamine-1 receptors. So what are the effects when you bind these receptors? So as you can see here, beta-1 uh, mostly has inotropic effects. This means that it increases the contractility of the heart, makes it beat stronger. The heart rate can also increase as well. Beta-2 in general doesn't have a lot of direct activity on the heart itself. I kind of remember it more as a vasodilatory effect in the bronchioles, um, but also in the vascular blood vessels as well. Alpha receptors, when they're stimulated, um, cause vasoconstriction. So this helps to increase the blood pressure by increasing the systemic vascular resistance. Dopamine 1 receptors uh, mostly act on the kidneys and this increases renal blood flow. So if you think about where the different receptors are, what drugs activate which receptor? This is a very broad overview and we're going to take some time to delve into each agent individually. But you can kind of see that agents that act um, primarily as inotropes, so increasing the contractility of the heart, increasing heart rate, are agents like dobutamine. Dobutamine acts mostly through uh, beta-1 receptors. Um, in addition, because of its beta-2 effects, it also has vasodilatory actions. Milrinone is another vasodilator that we'll discuss a little bit later. This one has the same net effects as far as inotropy and vasodilation, but through a different mechanism of action. Agents that affect uh, constriction through the alpha receptors are several that we'll talk about, and they all have varying degrees of effects on alpha receptors. So the agents we'll talk about here include norepinephrine, phenylephrine, epinephrine, uh, dopamine also has some alpha activity, but you can see that it's mixed with beta and dopamine. And then finally, we'll talk about vasopressin, which also acts to constrict blood vessels, but again, through a slightly different mechanism by binding the vasopressin or V1 receptors. I know the last slide was a little busy, so here's another way of thinking about the vasoactive agents. If you look at the arrow, I tried to put um, a spectrum. So agents that have more vasoconstrictive activity, versus those that have more inotropy or vasodilatory activity. So as we reviewed on a previous slide, agents that are more alpha-selective are going to vasoconstrict, versus agents that are more beta-selective are going to cause inotropy, increase heart rate, increase contractility. Those with beta-2 activity are going to cause more vasodilation. So for example, phenylephrine is a pure alpha agent, so think about that as causing vasoconstriction. Norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine we'll talk about have mixed alpha and beta activity to different degrees, so they're going to have some vasoconstriction and some inotropic effects. Dobutamine is more of a pure beta-selective agent in that it's primarily beta-1 and some beta-2 activity, so its primary effects are going to be inotropy and also vasodilation from the beta-2. We also said there's agents like vasopressin, that act via non-adrenergic pathways. So vasopressin acts via the V1 receptors, but its net effect is going to be vasoconstriction, similar to the alpha agents. Milrinone, on the other side, causes inotropy and vasodilation, similar to dobutamine, um, but through a different mechanism again. In this case, it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, which we'll discuss in more detail later. So let's start off with the first agent, which is vasopressin. So we'll kind of use this format as we go through all of the slides, but I first want you to think about, you know, what is the mechanism for each agent, and then what are the net hemodynamic effects? So as you may have remember, if you think about the mechanism of vasopressin, it is non-adrenergic, so it's not going to work through alpha or your beta receptors. Um, vasopressin works by stimulating V1 receptors, and what this does in the vasculature is it causes vasoconstriction. So this, when you're thinking about hemodynamic parameters, is related as an increase in systemic vascular resistance, or your SVR. 
it really doesn't have much effects as far as cardiac output and heart rate, so it's mostly a pure vasoconstrictor. Vasopressin is dosed as a continuous infusion at a rate of 0.01 to 0.04 units per minute. Although in practice, I would say it's typically started at a rate of 0.04 units per minute, and rather than titrating it, it's just turned on or off at the 0.04 units per minute. Some of the advantages of using vasopressin, one is that compared to a lot of the other vasoactive agents that we'll talk about, vasopressin is non-adrenergic. So when used in combination, it's thought to perhaps be synergistic in combination with an adrenergic agent. Another issue with adrenergic agents is that when patients are acidotic, it tends to decrease their responsiveness to catecholamines. And so vasopressin does retain its efficacy in acidosis. Finally, in patients with septic shock, it's been noted that their endogenous levels of vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone are depleted. And so some of the response that's seen when this drug is used in patients in septic shock is thought to be because we're kind of replacing the vasopressin that's deficient. So its place in therapy, uh, vasopressin is recommended as an adjunctive agent to norepinephrine in patients with septic shock. And this is based on the VAST trial in which the dose, uh, just to note, was actually studied at 0.03 units per minute. It's not recommended as monotherapy, again, based on the same trial where they didn't see a benefit for it as monotherapy um, versus as an adjunct agent alone. In general, although it's tempting sometimes in patients who are very hypotensive, it's not recommended to go above 0.04 units per minute. Um, because vasopressin can be a very strong constrictor, it seems to just clamp the vessels down so hard. So um, adverse effects such as worsening ischemia, or even heart attacks have been reported in patients. Phenylephrine is the next agent that we'll talk about. Um, this is the brand name called neosinephrine, and I just put it up there because we commonly at the hospital just refer to it as neo. So what are the receptor effects of neo? This one is a pure alpha agonist. It doesn't really have any beta one or beta two effects. So based on its alpha activity, what hemodynamic effects would you expect it to have? Alpha affects uh, vasoconstriction. So phenylephrine itself is going to have primarily effects on increasing systemic vascular resistance, or your SVR. Um, this is the primary way that it increases blood pressure. Again, because it lacks beta-1 or beta-2 effects, the heart rate and cardiac output don't change very much. It's dosed at a rate of 50 to 200 mics per minute. Um, at UCSD, we use mic per minute, although at other institutions, they do a weight-based, which ranges somewhere between 0.5 to 5 mics per kilo per minute. Phenylephrine, like most of the other pressors, has a very quick on and offset, so it can be titrated every few minutes until you reach your goal. As far as its place in therapy, you know, based on the literature, it's actually not considered first-line therapy um, for any of the types of shock. Even though it's a pure alpha agent, we'll discuss that it's actually a less potent alpha agonist than norepinephrine. Um, so in cases where you're looking for a strong alpha effect, norepinephrine tends to be preferred because it's more potent. The place in therapy for phenylephrine is in patients who have tachycardia or increased heart rate. As we'll see, most of the other agents that we'll go over have some sort of beta effect along with their alpha activity. So there is a possibility that the agent can cause fast heart rate. So if you have a patient who gets started on norepinephrine or dopamine, for example, they get very tachycardic because of the beta effects, phenylephrine may be a better alternative um, for just the pure alpha activity. So moving on is norepinephrine. Its brand name is called Levofed, and again, in practice, we often refer to this as just Levo. So its receptors effects. I mentioned before that it's got very strong alpha effects, um, but it also has some beta-1 activity. So what do you expect the hemodynamic effects to be for norepinephrine, right? Based on its alpha activity, you should expect to see an increase in SVR. And remember, this one is the most potent um, agent for increasing SVR. It also has a little bit of beta-1 effects. So this can increase cardiac output and heart rate to some extent. 
It's dosed at UCSD in mics per minute at a range of 0.5 to 30 mics per minute. Again, in other institutions, they do a weight base of 0.05 to 0.5 mics per kilo per minute. As I mentioned, as far as its effects go, it's the most potent alpha agent. Um, the reason why you may see some variation in cardiac output as listed above is just because of the reflex response. You know, once your body starts really clamping down and increasing afterload, this may cause a reflex decrease in your heart rate and subsequently your cardiac output. Based on its potency as an alpha agent, it has been shown to be more potent for constriction than dopamine and phenylephrine, and so that's why it tends to be recommended as a first-line agent for septic shock, in which your main problem is massive vasodilation from the inflammatory response. The next agent we'll talk about is epinephrine, and epinephrine actually has varying receptor effects depending on the dose. So at low doses, between 0.01 to 0.05, you get more beta-1 and beta-2 effects as compared to alpha. So hemodynamically, activating beta-1 is going to increase your cardiac output and heart rate the most. Um, beta-2 effects are going to actually vasodilate and decrease your SVR. As you increase the dose above 0.05 mics per kilo per minute, now you get more alpha than beta effects. So the alpha is going to increase your SVR, but you still from the beta effects get some increase in cardiac output and heart rate. Overall, epinephrine can be dosed at a range of 0.01 to 0.3 mics per kilo per minute. Adverse effects are just related to the mechanism of the drug. So ischemia is related to the alpha effects and the vasoconstriction. Tachyarrhythmias are related to the beta-1 effects um, in increasing heart rate. It's place in therapy. If you look at the surviving sepsis guidelines for septic shock patients, epinephrine is recommended as an additive agent or possibly as a replacement for norepinephrine. Um, however, in practice, I would say epinephrine is kind of one of those last-line agents that we throw on when nothing else has worked. The reason why I think it tends to be more of a last-line agent relates back to its effect on SVR. The beta-2 and the alpha effects sort of work against each other, so if you compare it to other agents like norepinephrine, epinephrine is actually a less potent vasoconstrictor overall. Like epinephrine, dopamine is another vasoactive agent whose receptor effects vary depending on the dose. So at a low dose of 1 to 3 mics per kilo per minute, you primarily activate dopamine 1 receptors. This is oftentimes referred to as renal dose dopamine. What happens when you activate dopamine 1 receptors is that you do dilate some of the vessels that feed into areas like the kidneys, and so this in turn increases renal blood flow, and you also do see an increase in urine output. So initially when people discovered this, they thought, oh, if I'm increasing urine output, I must be saving the kidneys. But when it's actually been studied in the literature, renal dose dopamine does not improve serum creatinine and it doesn't help prevent progression to things like kidney disease um, or prevent dialysis. So use of low dose dopamine just to protect the kidneys is not recommended. As you increase the dose between about 3 to 10 mics per kilo per minute, you start to see predominantly more beta-1 effects and a little bit of alpha. So hemodynamically, what this is going to cause is primarily an increase in cardiac output and heart rate due to the beta-1 effects, and you do get a little bit of vasoconstriction. As you increase the dose greater than 10 to 20 mics per kilo per minute, now alpha predominates um, with a little bit of beta-1 activity still. So hemodynamically, you're going to get a bigger increase in SVR with still some increase in cardiac output and heart rate. Place in therapy for dopamine, um, it's actually, because of its mixed receptor effects, can be potentially used in several different types of shock. So in septic shock, we'll discuss, you know, one of the main problems is vasodilation. So dopamine has been useful for helping increase vasoconstriction in those patients. Um, currently, though, it's viewed as a second-line agent to norepinephrine because it's less potent for alpha constriction. It may also be used in cardiogenic shock. As you can see, because it does have beta-1 and inotropic effects, that's useful. And some of the alpha activity can help patients who 
have severe cardiogenic shock that are also presenting with moderate to severe hypotension. One note for dopamine is that it does tend to be very highly arrhythmogenic, particularly with causing tachyarrhythmias due to the strong beta effects. So oftentimes you may start patients on dopamine um, for their blood pressure, but their heart rate also increases dramatically because of this drug, and so they have to discontinue because they just don't tolerate the increase in heart rate. So next we'll talk about dobutamine, which as you can see here is a predominantly a beta agonist um, with more activity at beta 1 versus beta 2. It does have a little bit of alpha effects, but this is pretty negligible. So overall, what does it do hemodynamically? Again, the strong beta-1 effects are going to increase your cardiac output and heart rate. In this case, the beta-2 is going to cause vasodilation as the predominant effect on the vasculature. So it's dosed um, anywhere in a range between 2 to 20 mics per kilo per minute, although I would say in practice when we're using it for cardiogenic shock, it's typically less than 10 mics per kilo per minute. Um, because of its effects as a vasodilator through beta-2, you do have to be careful in patients who have shock who already have you know, moderate to severe hypotension because if you start this agent, it can drop their SBR and make their blood pressure lower. The other thing with dobutamine that you can see is that tolerance can develop within the first 48 to 72 hours, and this is due to a downregulation of the beta receptors. You can always increase the dose further, but this can sometimes be limiting for long-term treatment, and you may consider other agents. Its place in therapy, um, as you can hopefully imagine, is mostly in patients with cardiogenic shock or decompensated heart failure because it's very good at supporting um, increased cardiac output and increased heart rate. And it can also help reduce some of the afterload um, that is detrimental in patients with decompensated heart failure. So milrinone, again, what's its mechanism of action? We mentioned before that it's different. It's not through um, any of the adrenergic receptors. In this case, it's a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor. And what phosphodiesterase 3 does, if you inhibit it, is it prevents the breakdown of cyclic AMP, and that increases intracellular calcium. So what are the hemodynamic effects? Um, if you look, phosphodiesterase 3 is present in different areas. So when you inhibit phosphodiesterase 3 in the heart, it increases cardiac output. When you inhibit phosphodiesterase 3 in the vasculature, it actually causes vasodilation. So you see a decrease in your SVR. It's dosed at 0 0.3 to 0 0.75 mics per kilo per minute, and it is renally cleared, so you do have to reduce the dose um, typically by about 50% in renal insufficiency. Uh, some places do use a loading dose of milrinone uh, because it does have a slower onset than the other agents. Um, however, in practice, we typically avoid the loading dose because of the decrease in SVR. A lot of patients don't tolerate the hypotension. Just like dobutamine, because milrinone itself does decrease SVR, you do have to be careful starting it in patients who are already severely hypotensive to begin with. They may not tolerate it either. In comparing with uh, the effects of milrinone versus dobutamine, um, overall dobutamine is felt to be a stronger inotropic agent. Um, you can also see that milrinone doesn't have as much of a direct effect on heart rate, so that can be a plus in patients who you're worried about cardiac ischemia versus dobutamine where it can increase the heart rate. Um, if you compare their effects on vasodilation and SVR, milrinone is thought to be more potent at decreasing SVR. So again, patients may develop more hypotension on this agent, um, but you don't get the tachyphylaxis that you see with dobutamine. So its place in therapy, similar to dobutamine, because it is an inotrope and a vasodilator, is for the same set of patients, cardiogenic shock and decompensated heart failure. So that concludes our overview of the different vasoactive agents. Again, how I kind of like to think of them broadly is to consider what their hemodynamic effects are. Is it vasoconstriction or is it more inotropy and vasodilation or a combination of the two? And as we move into our discussion of shock, we'll see that the different types of shock have different hemodynamic targets. So once you determine what the targets are, whether it's you need more vasoconstriction or you need more inotropy, 
Hopefully then it makes sense when we talk about selection of agents based on their mechanism of action.